for this opportunity to share with you some preliminary insight of a paper I'm working in entitled Subaltern Environmentalism, Women, Indigenous People and Envisioning Post-Structive Society in Peru and Ecuador. It is a complex title and I hope I can unpack all these complexities in a very simple way so you can get the message of what I'm trying to do. Um, and the first thing that I would like to say is that these papers uh, seek to intervene in the broader debate about uh, the strategic role of the extractive industry in the politics of uh, development in Latin America and also how this industry is triggering an amount of socio-environmental conflicts through which the affected populations um, raise their voices to react against the impacts or potential impacts in their environment, in their culture, in their livelihood. And this is a phenomenon that is manifested in similar intensity throughout the region in countries as politically diverse as Peru, who is often uh, described as conservative country due to its uh, neoliberal oriented economy, and also in the so-called post-neoliberal post post neoliberal or progressive countries as Ecuador, due to its uh, discourse against neoliberalism. And with this paper, uh, with this paper is also motivated with uh, a sense of personal insatisfaction in the way that these socio-environmental conflicts were often treated or often understood in public debates where the prevalent view is to oversimplify them as a matter of con uh, two contrasted views, uh, that of radical environmentalism versus those mining supporters, which they tend to def uh, defend themselves or, or portray themselves as uh, defenders of, of progress. Um, so this narrow understanding also speaks about the polarization and to some degree to the social confrontation that is, these two countries are experiencing um, when it comes to public debates where we have to discuss the role of the extractive industry in development. So the purpose of this paper is to offer a broader perspective by which I want to integrate uh, the environmental justice framework with inside of subaltern studies. And the idea by using this framework is not only to um, disclose or dig deeper into what, what lies beneath socio-environmental conflicts, but also to highlight the positive side of conflict uh, in the sense that is it's providing new opportunities to revisit the politics of development in the country and also creating new opportunities to address historical wrongs in terms of recognizing the voice of those people who have been historically marginalized in society. So the way I have structured my, pres my presentation is as follows. No, oh, it's not working. Oh. I'm an old-fashioned presenter. Yeah. So in the first part, I will focus in the phenomenon of social environmental conflicts. I will describe it, how is it, going, uh, how is it uh, happening, unfolding in Peru and Ecuador. Mm -hmm. What are the dominant approaches to understand those conflicts? And, um, mm -hmm. and then I will uh, justify the, the usefulness of using subaltern environmentalism as an alternative lens. And then in the second part, I will focus on the Peruvian case by using an emblematic case, uh, socio environmental conflicts conflict uh, known as the Bagua case to show how subaltern uh, groups are making changes uh, from below. And then I will proceed with the Ecuadorian case and will I focus in, in the case of Women Defenders of Mother Earth. This is an organization which, uh, with whom I'm collaborating on my postdoctoral research project. And uh, to show how the impact of extraction it's not gender neutral and, and, and what they are doing to make this visible. And finally, we will lead, all this discussion will lead us to look at post-extractivism and how these groups are inspiring this proposal, what it entails, and what are the possibilities to be, uh, to be implemented in Latin America. And I will try to leave 15 to 20 minutes of, for questions and answer period. I say I will try because Latino Americans are known because they speak a lot. Um, so the first, the first thing that we need to know is that over the last two decades, Latin America has experienced an unprecedented expansion of destructive industry due to a different factors. And when I say destructive industry, I'm gonna make a parenthesis here that I'm talking about mining, hydrocarbon, and oil. 
Um, and and, and these this factors, uh, or this expansion was resulting from a range of factors that include the, the um, known, well-known macrostructural reforms during the decade of 1990s that um, attracted a, a, a great flow of investments in Latin America, particularly in the extractive industry, and also the rise of international price of uh, mineral commodities, which after a drop during the economic crisis in 2008 is rapidly uh, recu uh, recuperating um, in the subsequent years. In Peru, the extractive industry represents, particularly mining, represents uh, the model of macroeconomic development. Development. It represents the six percent of the contribute to the six percent of the GDP of the country, sixty percent of the exports. And in Ecuador, despite the well-known disastrous environmental consequences due, due, due to decades of oil exportation, now the country is turning into opening the doors for large-scale in, mining investments. In both countries, the discourse is the similar, the similar rhetoric to defend and justify um, the reliance on extractive activities. In the case of Peru, the, the slogan, grow with inclusion, and in the case of Ecuador, the slogan, new extractivism, are used to signify that we are living in new times in which a sustainable mining or more responsible extractive industry will lead us to collect the necessary funding to finance, finance the uh, social policies to address poverty, to um, enhance social inclusion, and to also ameliorate inequalities, the, the, the all ills that have suffered the region. But paradoxically, despite uh, alongside the economic growth experience in Peru, and also this promise of uh, inclusive equality in Ecuador, what's the extractive industry is bringing is an, in, an increment of conflict, the so-called socio-environmental conflicts that are defined as tensions between the state, communities, and companies over the use, control, and protection of natural resources, protection of the environment. And inherent in these conflicts are also social, cultural, and political components. So for instance, in the case of Peru, the report of social conflicts, the, the recent report of December 2013, uh, report on social conflicts from the Peruvian Ombudsman Office uh, indicates that the country has 139 social environmental conflicts, which um, amount for 100 zero, 100 zero cases that are related specifically to the mining industry, and uh, 17 cases are related to the hydrocarbons. In the case of Ecuador, all the uh, five major projects uh, that are located in that region, the south region that is in the border of Peru, which is an area that is very rich in biodiversity and natural uh, resources. All these, these cases include the projects, of known projects of Mirador, Rio Blanco, Quinsacocha, San Carlos Pananza, and Fruta del Norte are experiencing conflicts as well. So what has been said about those environmental conflicts? The analysis of these conflicts in the literature has received significant attention, and particularly from, from the area of political ecology, and most notably the work of Anthony Bevington. And from, from them, the, 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 it has spread um, another bodies of literature that are adopting those lenses as well. And this literature has provided useful insights to understand the occurrence and intensification of uh, social conflicts. Um, and they say that those conflicts are linked to perceptions of environmental risk, uh, which tend to be higher in places with no history of mining activities or little history of mining activities in comparison to those places where they have a long history of mining activities. Then um, they also point to uncertainty about how these extractive projects will transform life of people, particularly how they will transform culture um, and, and their own well-being. And also by concrete cases of dispossession of land, uh, loss of livelihood, and health impacts. And if you are particularly interested in, in the impacts in health and environment, I uh, will recommend you to look for the La Oroya case in Central Andes, Peru, where 90% of the children for, were reported to suffer from lead poisoning um, as a result of melting activities. And it's, it's considered one of the cases, uh, the most grave cases of environmental pollution in Latin America along with Chernobyl was, was named by the Blacksmith Institute in 2006 as the, one of the most polluting places on earth. And, and you see in those cases how conflicts are translating also in communities that 
because of the dependence on mining activities, they cannot defend their health because they feel that if they do it, then they will lose jobs. So this is one of the problems that these kind of conflicts also bring into light. And finally, well, that is related to what I'm saying is the unequal concerns about the unequal distribution of benefits, demands of jobs, and, and who will benefit from social programs. Only the people who work for, for, the, for the companies or, or the rest of the community, what is the range? So the ultimate goal of, of this literature is to show how all different cases relate to each other, and together they're showing how the region is transforming territorially and also politically. But aside from this body of literature, the analysis of socio-environmental conflicts within a more demanding framework of environmental justice and subalternity as a manifestation of the post-colonial critique has received very little attention, surprisingly, or the attention has been more descriptive than analytical. And some exceptions include the work of uh, Bonaventura Sousa Santos and, and Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who is based in the University of Los Andes in Colombia, and on the, notion, the use of the notion subaltern uh, cosmopolitan legality. But what could be the contribution of the environmental justice framework or subaltern environmentalism that integrates environmental justice and subaltern studies? Um, as some of you may already be familiar, the environmental justice movement emerged in the decade of 1980s in the States. And it was um, very strategic in unveiling and also popularizing the fact that the largest amount of industrial plants and toxic waste were affecting, with, with consequences in health and environment, were located particularly in neighborhoods of low income population and particularly neighborhoods were, were living low income, uh, were, uh, visible minorities were uh, located, Afro-Americans, Latinos, and Aboriginal communities. And they, these were the population, as demonstrated by the movement, that were, they suffer um, the brunt of environmental pollution and were subsidizing with their health the well-being, the um, industrial development, and the economic growth of the rest of the country, meaning upper, middle, and upper class Caucasians. So extrapolating this analysis to the context of extraction is useful to sensitize the public, in my view, on how the current politics of extractive-led development create what I call system of trade-off, that resembling this utilitarian calculus is geared towards promoting greater economic growth for the greater number, but at the expenses of um, the well-being of historical man marginalized people, in this case, indigenous people, peasant communities, and women within them. And put it differently, um, this framework has allowed us to understand how the politics of extraction tend to distribute risk disproportionate, disproportionately, impacted mainly individuals and communities that already suffer other social disadvantages. And subaltern studies, on the other hand, it's, it's a project that started in post-colonial India and was influenced by the work of Anthony Gramsci, and then was translated to Latin America around the decade of 1980s, and was more prominent with the work, if you're familiar, with the work of Walter Mignolo, and also Ileana Rodriguez and other scholars like Enrique Dussel. And for some reason, it, it became less uh, prominent after the insertion of neoliberal thinking in Latin America. And I think that we, we should um, uh, bring it back to this discussion. So this framework, what it offers is, is useful insights to understand how um, the relationship of dom existing relationship of domination versus dominant in society create or are res result in subordinating, subordinating people in terms of race, ethnicity, class, and gender, but are known as the subaltern. And these are the people who systemically are treated as inferior and whose agency and opportunity to build their own history and development is often denied. So in the context of extraction, so alternative speaks about the power of the dominant class, and here I locate governments and in alliance sometimes with destructive industry that frames the economic uh, development agenda with all, always the influence of international uh, economic forces. 
and also influence uh, the way in which the idea of progress and good living of some are superior or more valuable than that of others. Subaltern studies accordingly propose to restore the agency to the subaltern and rethink history of development from the perspective of the subaltern. So the idea of borrowing from subaltern studies is to um, portray the groups that express resistance to extractive activities not only as victims or potential victims of environmental injustice, but also to show, to show them as agents of change, as political actors, which resistance don't only express the need or the demand for um, a sustainable mining or for better distribution of mineral rents, but fundamentally they point out to uh, changes in the very idea of how we understand development in the first place. And this is important, this is an important reminder to government authorities specifically, because they often treat anti-mining resistance as a problem of governance alone, and it's more complex than, than that. Um, but using the environment, subaltern environmental framework, I also want to highlight that um, socio-environmental conflicts are also giving rise to what I call subaltern environmental consciousness, referring to the fact that subaltern groups, but by placing instrumental or intrinsic value to the environment, are advancing demands for environmental, of environmental justice in close connection to demands for cultural and social economic justice that transcend local spaces and geographical boundaries. And some examples of this in the case of Peru include the emergence of organizations such as the National Coordination for Communities Affected by Mining Activities, that it's a recent phenomenon, the, and the Interethnic Association for the Development of the Peruvian Amazon. In the case of Ecuador, we have the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of, of Ecuador, the National Coordination for the Defense of Life and Sovereignty, which was the anti-mining movements that emerged after, I will tell later, um, Korea's decision to um, open the doors to large-scale mining. And also, women organization that are more prominent, as I see it, in Ecuador than in Peru, and I will, I will discover why after going to Ecuador to do my fieldwork. Um, and one of them is uh, the Latin American Union of Women that include this fascinating network of grassroots uh, women organization across Latin America who defend the environment and their human rights against extractive industry. So now let's move to uh, the analysis of case study countries to see how environmental injustice are distributed in society and how the subaltern groups are um, mobilizing um, in, to respond to them. So in Peru, the, he the geographical distribution of mining concessions in a way shades light on how environmental injustice are distributed, unequally distributed in society, affecting predominantly indigenous people or our uh, peasant communities that are located in the Andes or the Amazon region of Peru. So to date, 20.3% of the national territory of Peru is under mining concession. This includes 15 of the most important watersheds in the country um, that have more than the 20-50% of their surface under concession. In the Amazon region, 11 hydrocarbon projects blocks sorry, overlay protected areas, 17 overlap reserves of native people in voluntary isolation, and 58 overlap land titles to indigenous people. And another factor that we need to consider is that up until recently, the Ministry of Energy and Mines was the authority responsible for both, for promoting extractive activities in the country <laughs> and approving and monitoring environmental impact assessment studies. So this has been recently changes in December 2013. Last December has been approved uh, 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 the, a new entity called Senase who is going to do this uh, monitoring and approval in replacement of uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mines. But it was it was... It was a process of long discussions and, and challenge to the political power. Um, so obviously this has created suspicious of a great deal of suspicious, suspicion among communities and civil society organizations because of the lack of objectivity of this approval. And finally, even thought um, Peru um, 
ratified the ILO Convention 169 in 1994, acknowledging the right of indigenous people to a prior consultation. The legal implementation of this right didn't happen until 2011, until late 2011, meaning that prior consultation mechanisms were almost not in place uh, in any mining concessions uh, that was granted. So such systematic omission unfolded in one of the bloodiest uh, cases, socio-environmental conflicts known as the Bagua case, about which I'm going to talk now. So the Bagua case, I may say that it, it's marked an historical turning point in the politics of recognition of Aboriginal rights in Peru. Um, the Bagua events refer to the socio-environmental conflict that unfolded during the second um, government of uh, Alan Garcia, former president Alan Garcia, and it was the result of the implementation of the free trade agreement with USA. Uh, what happened there? Um, under the FTA framework, the executive power was authorized by the parliament to pass a series of legislative degrees facilitating private investment, mining and oil in areas occupied by peasant and indigenous communities in the Peruvian Amazon. And after uh, these people become aware of what was going on, they, they they contact Peruvian authorities to um, ask them to derogate this, these laws because the, there was no prior consultation process in place. Uh, the government authorities promised to derogate legislation affecting their property rights, but the systematic delay and indifference in achieving an adequate response to their demands is what led them to a series of protests and blockages and, um, and ended up, up in, in this confrontation that resulted in um, dozen of deaths and hundreds of casualties, and it's a very famous case. You can Google the Bawa case and you can get all this information. This case created a social backlash in Peru, where for the first time, Peruvian society in its entirety started to talk about the need to implement uh, the right of prior consultation to indigenous people. This case, as I see it, is emblematic for two reasons. But the first one is because it it clearly disclosed how the subaltern is portrayed in, in the discourse, in the political discourse. And I'm going to just show one of the phrases uh, in this infamous uh, quote. Now, President Alan Garcia declared, after the Bawa events, these persons are not in power. They are not first class citizens. First class, they are second. 400 natives, 400,000 natives cannot say to 28 million Peruvians that you have no right to come here. So the, the utilitarian discourse, the, the, the great good for the greater number is, is very present in this type of um, affirmations. But the Bawa case is also emblematic because it also show how the subaltern um, challenged the subalternity um, to co or counteract such subal subordination by making their voices here as political actors of change. And here I want to mention that indigenous people, and particularly Amazonian organization, were crucial actors in, in, in then play a significant role in the passing of the national law of free prior and informer, informed consultation in 2011 during the government of Ollantumala. And although the implementation of this right, and here we have to be honest, has not been the panacea to pacify protesters, and the satisfaction remain among Aboriginal people in the sense that such right um, in practice operates as an administrative tool to promote what they call intercultural dialogue rather than grant a right to veto to extract projects. It is undeniable, undeniable that this right um, right of consultation represents a valuable first step to, one, uh, revisit what some Peruvian legal scholars describe as an historical invisibility of uh, indigenous people, an historical legal invisibility of indigenous people in Peruvian legislation and in Peruvian policies. And also, two, to infuse maturity to the Peruvian public policy characterized by a lack of proactivity when it comes to regulate indigenous issues. And today I, I want to show um, a snapshot of, of this page of the Ministry of Culture and this Ministry of Interculturality is now in charge of, of developing the policy of interculturality in Peru. We have 
uh, for the first time in their history, a database of indigenous people. This was, uh, you would ask Peruvians, like, only five years ago, if they will know how many Aboriginal communities were in the country, they wouldn't know. Now you have this information available. Um, and we also have developed a methodological guidance to implement the prior consultation um, right in Peru. And as I say, it's not perfect, but those are advances that have to be acknowledged as well. So now let's turn to the Ecuadorian case. I find the Ecuadorian case fascinating, even more than Peru, because it shows the promises and limitation of the so-called post-neoliberal regimes. Like any other Latin American countries, um, perhaps except to Bolivia, Ecuador underwent uh, an important reforms aimed to transform the political structure and epistemological structures of the country. And a manifestation of this transformation um, we see more specifically in the rewritten of the 2008 Constitution. <clears throat> in the 2008 Constitution, the political project of Wembibi was, was acknowledged as a guidance for a more inclusive uh, and egalitarian society and was greatly influenced by indigenous um, worldview, cosmovision. Buen vivir, sumac coisac in the Quechua language of collective well-being in English uh, was entrenched as a, as a guiding principle, as I mentioned, uh, to build this new Ecuadorian society. And it represents an historical achievement for indigenous people as it entails a conceptual rupture with neoliberalism and dominant models of development. It also um, looks for um, acknowledging the nature of Ecuador as, as a plurinational country, an intercultural country, and it also represents a new form of coexistence in diversity and ar harmony with nature that led Ecuadorian society through this constitution to uh, acknowledge rights to Mother Earth. And Ecuador is the only constitution in the planet that has, that has granted rights to Earth. So in the same line, Ecuador also approved a legislation that is called the Mining Mandate. It, it, was, it was in the process of approving the constitution that they did it. And through this legislation, they wanted to uh, address historical wrongs and specifically the way that mining concessions were granted during the, the, the time of neoliberalism. So they declared the extinction of all mining concessions that were given during, in exploratory phase, that were given during that time, that overlap with natural protected areas, have not complied with environmental impact assessment studies and prior consultation mechanisms. And here I want to uh, highlight that Ecuador acknowledged in their constitution the right to prior consultation to indigenous people, and also the right to prior consultation to non-indigenous people in issues that will impact the environment. Uh, those are Article 57 for the first and Article 398 for the second. Uh, and consistent with this legislation, was, uh, Ecuador also developed what is called the National Plan for Good Living of Wembivir that is specifically acknowledge that extractive industry limits the objective of good living because it propels an equal accumulation of wealth and irrational exploitation of nature. So what they propose is instead we should, we should try to break this dependency on the extractive industry and look towards an economy that is more diversified and um, put more emphasis in knowledge production and biodiversity, and they were talking about community-based ecotourism and biomedicine that are um, good activities for the type of, of uh, um, resources that they have. But in practice, however, the mining mandate was only implemented for um, the, this, what we can describe as a smaller scale projects, whereas the larger project that I show in the first map a big, the, the projects that belong to big corporations, the majority of them Canadian, uh, were left intact. So uh, obviously this, this has led some indigenous organizations to present informant actions or legal action before the Constitutional Court of Ecuador to declare the invalidity of these uh, mining concessions in agreement to what was stipulated in the mining mandate. And uh, the, we are still waiting for the decision in that regard. But this is one of the controversies right now in Ecuador is the implementation of the mining man mandate. So, here, like in the case of uh, Peru with Alan Garcia, Ecuador, um, um, 
President Rafael Correa, Ecuadorian president, defend the mining industry saying, don't be fooled, we cannot be bigger sitting on a mountain of gold. Mining with social and environmental responsibility can help us to exit poverty and underdevelopment. And this discourse was, this belief led him recently to rescind the often acclaimed Yasuni ITT initiative aiming to protect the unparalleled biodiversity of the Ecuadorian Yasuni um, National Park from oil exploitation. And again, the argument when he was interviewed, when he was uh, interviewed by the media, national and international media, the argument w was, we need oil to fight poverty. An argument in which concerns uh, for cultural rights and concerns for protection of the environment are not factored. So now, um, Let's turn to what's going on and what's the response to subaltern groups. And, and obviously the pro-mine and uh, discourse of uh, President Correa that continued through his recent mandate, re-election, has triggered a series of protests and led to the constitution of new organization in which the presence of women become more, more visible, and as I said at the beginning, more visible than in Peru. Um, and one of them is the case of Women Defender of Mother Earth, uh, Frente de Mujeres Defensoras de la Pachamama. And it's an organization with whom I'm um, collaborating, working in collaboration right now to, uh, as part of my postdoctoral research project here at the Human Rights Center. And I would be happy to talk about that if, if you need personally. Um, so this organization was funded in 2008. Um, and uh, the goal was the defense of the territories, of ways of living, and make visible the contribution of women in the anti-mining resistance. And what I was told from these women in, in, in some of my recent interviews on Skype is that they decided to constitute as a single organization only constituted by women because although the presence of women was, was higher was than men in, in the mobili anti-mining mobilization, the presence of women at the leadership level was almost absent. So they decided to do it by in their own. And at the moment, their activism is concentrated on getting the government to seize the Rio Blanco and Quimsacocha projects um, in the province of Asue for the same reason that uh, all the other projects are being questioned and no prior consultation mechanism were in play, projects overlap natural protected areas, specifically the Moyeturo, Moyepongo protected forest and the Cajas National Park that was recently declared as a world biodiverse biosphere reserve by the UNESCO. And obviously these were the cases that according to the mining mandate, should have been uh, seized or revert to the state, but they didn't because they, they considered it like a strategic projects for the national economy. One thing to mention about this organization is that their defense of, what they, they, they mention is that the defense of Mother Earth or Pachamama emerges as a result of their spiritual connection to nature as creator of life. Nonetheless, as a subsistent peasant, they also have instrumental uh, reasons to defend for defending Mother Earth. And as Lina Solano, the funding members of Women Defender of Mother Earth mentioned, and I quote here, to a great extent, women in this province, the province of Asue, are in charge of family farming plots, and for many of them, they also represent their main source of income and subsistence. If large scale mining arrives and displaces these units of local, of local economy, women will be the most affected as they will lose their economy, their economic autonomy and sense of power. And this is a reality that is all, always or almost uh, made invisible when talking about the impact of mining activities. Um, and here I want to talk about what are the lessons of this women anti-mining activism is, is bringing. And there are various lessons, but here I wanted to highlight three of them that I think are the most remarkable. Um, first, the presence of women in the anti-mining mobilization is acting as a reminder that uh, when thinking about subaltern groups in terms of peasant or indigenous people or indigenous community, we should avoid the tendency of homogenize their identity in a way that obscure the particular reality of women. What this reality tell us is that the impacts of extractive industry are not gender neutral. This woman had pointed out, for, for instance, on my talks to them, to the persistence of a machista idiosyncrasy, along with mining companies 
promises of jobs, which are predominantly male-oriented, uh, some of the factors that conceal their aspiration and needs and further exacerbated social exclusion. They explain that the promise of jobs are already creating tensions in the community that translate in tensions within the family. So this is why when they go on the street to raise their voices to protect their sources of subsistence, livelihood, and defend the right of consultation of the community, they are often treated as ignorant, as obstructionist to job opportunities, and incapable to make rational political decisions given their condition as peasant and also women. So the, this evidence is in line actually with the studies that show that destructive projects tend to exacerbate disadvantages for women, not only in terms of employment opportunities and the increase of economic dependency towards their husband, as I mentioned in the case of Loroya, um, but also in terms of impact to their reproductive health, exclusion from process of prior consultation, and increase in domestic violence and sexual exploitation. Unfortunately, the, re the research on women and mining it's, it's not as prominent as research in other areas on the impact of uh, structural activities uh, on population. And that's, what one, that's why I decided to focus here, because there is a call for more research in this area. So the, the studies, I can, I can uh, point to a handful of studies. And interestingly, some of them have been uh, conducted by the World Bank. Um, and, and then the Rio Tinto uh, mining company is also putting emphasis on look at women to develop their corporate social responsibility um, uh, guidance uh, because they know that instrumentally for the purpose of getting social license, they, they, they need to look at the role of women in society. And third, and, and this is um, something that I'm starting to develop um, through the, the course of my research um, on, on this case is, is the idea that um, women, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the idea that the extractive um, industry as a model of development is creating this system of trade-off. Um, at the national level, the first layer of trade-off at the national level expressed by the prioritization of extractive based economic growth, economic growth at the expense of other industries like let's say agriculture, local agriculture, and of the well-being and rights of subaltern groups involved in more traditional economic activities. And this trade-off is then reproduced at the local level particularly in divided communities where they have this tension between jobs or uh, defending their own um, subsistence. And in, in these cases where the promise of job in mining development displaces concerns over preservation of land, culture, and gender equality that are more subdued. And ultimately this translates into what can be described as a normative trade-off, or what I call also a quality trade-off. And this normative trade-off is manifested in the prioritization of the redistributive dimension of, of equality by means of redistribution of mineral, mining royalties and taxes coming from the mining activity, resulting in the reinforcement of social exclusion and the aggravation of other dimensions of equality as cultural participatory and gender equality. One thing to mention here that I, I didn't and I should have done it before, all these cases of uh, social protests are uh, leading to what is called in the literature criminalization of protests of activists and subaltern groups. So that put question how uh, mechanism participation are in place in, in these countries where activists basically fight for two, for the, for the rights, in essence for the rights to protect communities, uh, prior consultation and also for the right to defend their rights. Um, so together all this trade-off put in, in to question the sustainability of the model of development based on natural resource extraction. It is not conductive to what in Ecuador is called buen vivir. So what to do then? So here we come to the post-extractivism. Um, motivated by the well-documented environmental um, impact of the uh, extractive industry in Latin America and also inspired by uh, the subaltern environmental movement that is emerging in, in, in the region, a group of scholars led by, by Eduardo Gudinas and based at the Center for Latin Amer Centro Latinoamericano de Ecología Social Center for Latin American Center for Social Ecology. I should have translated that before. Um, <clears throat> 
And they are advancing a proposal for change the economy in Latin America in a way that is, becomes less dependent to, um, extractive, to destructive industry. So what they say or the way that they describe this proposal is an exploratory exercise and something that is nurturing from feedback from activists, from academics, and, and it's a, a learning on the go process. There is no one fit all formula that will tell how to move directly from a extractive society into a post extractive society. And this is a process that will uh, be, they have to respond to the particularities of every uh, context and country. But what ba they basically say, um, say is that post extractivism is a transition a progressive transition from the current context that is described as predatory extraction, characterized by a strong economic dependence on the industry and the externalization of social and environmental costs to local communities, to a context that is called sensible extraction. And there we will um, see um, proposals as um, making environmental laws and regulations stronger than they are now, making effective corporate social responsibility commitments, to finally arrive to what he uh, or what they call indispensable extraction or, or post-extractivism. This stage does not mean that extractive activities will be prohibited um, completely, but rather to make them only available in circumstances and geographical spaces where there is no risk to trigger social and cultural and ecological damages. And for instance, uh, they w will have to implement um, or passing laws of use of the land and declare some zones uh, free of mining activities. But fundamentally for this to happen, as uh, Eduardo Gurin mentioned, there is a need for a transformation, a shift in a way societies understand development quality of life and economy um, in the first place. And this is development needs to stop being equated to economic growth and consumerism alone, to include austerity as opposed to unlimited growth, local values, respect to nature and sustainability, pretty much in line to the proposal of, of uh, Buen Vivir that is ingrained in, in this idea of uh, indigenous uh, people to live in, in, in relation to nature, uh, not exploit nature, but live in relation to nature. So proponents of constructivism, as I mentioned, um, they say that this is not a one size fit all formula, but at the same time they acknowledge that um, they are conscious that such transition will unlikely happen unless regional strategies um, connect Latin American economies and environmental policies as a whole. Um, and the reason is, if one country alone decides not for the regulated industry while well, reducing investment flows from the extractive sector, then such investments will uh, move to another country or another economy with more favorable conditions for the industry. So the proposal is to move to what they call as autonomous regionalism that depend less on the global economy and contrast, um, in contrast um, promotes a new paradigm of development and environmental governance from the south. And all this information you can find on the webpage of uh, CLAES. So it's fascinating. They are working not only in your way, but there is a network of academics connected right now in different countries in Latin America that are developing research at, and a network system where if you are uh, subscribing to their, their database, you will receive information every day of what's going on in the whole region. And it's fascinating how things are working right now. Um, particularly for researchers, you, you get updates of, of what is going on minute by minute. Um, but the question is how feasible is post-extractivism for Latin America, or this overarching aspiration of building a post-extractive society in general. And there is certainly no straightforward response, but if we look at um, these two contracts in perspective, I think that we will have a much clearer idea why we took serious, we should take seriously the proposal of post-extractivism. And some of the reasons are as follow. The political discourse in Ecuador often linked mining investment with the creation of jobs. What does it tell us the Peruvian case that has a longer history of mining activities than Ecuador? In Peru, a country with a long mining tradition, the mining sector only contributes to 1% of its economic active, economically active population in the country. And 
I'm citing the source there. Whereas at the local level, access to high paying jobs are reserved to individuals with certain qualifications that are not necessarily made by local people. Um, and let alone the other jobs that are lost, for instance, uh, jobs in, in, in agriculture, on local agriculture, uh, when extraction or mining absorb the local economy. So the argument that mining leads to higher jobs can be defeated in a way. It's, it's not as it's promoted um, right now in the region. And then the other thing that we need to consider is the, the, the second argument, that is mining investments will lead to finance redistributed policies to reduce poverty. Well, improve, there are, there are studies that show that this is not happening necessarily. And there is one particular study by, uh, conducted by Ario Yano Yang was that shows how redistribution of mineral royal, royalties through fiscal innovations did not reduce poverty and conflict, it rather enhance or increase conflict, particularly in those regions where have, that would receive the, the, the major amount of mining royalties were the, 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 the regions that have the highest amount of social environmental conflicts. So this is another thing to, to put in, in consideration. And finally, in terms of subaltern groups, in Ecuador, subaltern groups were fundamental to first transform the constitutional framework to make it more in line to aspiration of, post of a post-extractive society Although later, political power brokers overlooked these changes. In Peru, it happened the contrast. The constitutional and institutional framework, the neoliberal uh, oriented framework, is, is not obviously as promises, promising as in the case of Ecuador. However, subaltern groups have been fundamental in enhancing later in a way that facilitates the transition or will facilitate the transition to a post-extractive economy or society. So the lesson then, at least for me, this is a, uh, just a preliminary insight of what I, I hope to develop further later after going to the field. The lesson is that there is no direct and smooth pathway towards post-extractivism. There will always be periods of continuity and change in a context where the progressiveness of um, institutional framework, constitutional framework, seems not to be as important to change as the actions of resistance of subaltern environmental groups who can put a stop to the spites extractive project with mass public protest. So I say this can be controversial, but it's, it's what I'm, the preliminary insights I'm, I'm gathering from comparing these two countries. So just to conclude and go to final reflections, um, Latin America is a region that during the 1990s was sort of um, the laboratory of neo neoliberalism and now is demonstrating to be one of the most promising spaces in terms of subaltern environmental mobilization and the emergence of new discourses to challenge the legacy of neoliberalism and its influence in the politics of development, particularly in the case of uh, the ex extractive-led development. <clears throat> And there are important insights that uh, the region can bring to the whole world. And my sense is that post the post-extractive project will have better option if subaltern environmental movements from the south start working in coalition and collaboration with subaltern environmental movements in the north, like more connection with indigenous people from the south and the north, which is going on at a certain level, more at the UN level. But I think that it needs, to, it needs major engagement also at, at the, the, from the bottom up. Um, and also, the post-extractive project will have better options if the academia and activists from the north um, begin to engage in debates about the possibilities and limitations of the post-extractive project as a, as, as, a, as a global project. So on that note, I opened, uh, um, I stop my presentation here and open the conversation now to your insight question.